Chapter Six of The Secret of the Ninth Planet, Version Two by Donald Walheim. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Chapter Six. Sunward Ho. Gradually the ship settled down to routine. There was, as Burl discovered, nothing very much to do for most of the crew on such a space flight. The course was charted in advance, a pattern laid out that would carry the ship falling towards its objective falling in a narrow curving orbit. A certain amount of time would pass during which the ship would traverse a specific section of this plotted route at a certain rate of speed or acceleration. Then, at a specified moment, the speed would be checked, the attraction of the sun reversed, and the ship would attempt to break itself and to hold its fall toward the great sun. At such a time as its fall came to a stop, it should, if the calculations had been correct, be crossing the orbit of the planet Venus in the same place and about the same moment that Venus itself would be. In that way the ship would arrive at the planet. Now all these calculations had been made, and once made, set into motion on the control panels of the ship. The interval of many days between actually left little to do except for making astronomical observations, checking on the performance of the stellarators, setting a watch against the damage caused by meteors and micrometeors, and following the ordinary procedures of meals and sleep periods. The men set up an Earth-time schedule of twenty-four hours, divided the crew into three eight-hour shifts, and conducted themselves accordingly. Burl did not find time weighing on his hands. Despite the limited space available to the ten men, there was always something to learn and something to think about. When Russell Clyde was off duty, he spent much time with Burl at the widescreen viewers that showed the black depths of interplanetary space surrounding them. The Earth dwindled to a brilliant green disk, while ahead of them the narrow crescent of approaching Venus could be seen, growing gradually. Ruddy Mars was sharp but tiny, a point of russet beyond the green of Earth. And the stars! Never had Burl seen so many stars! a firmament ablaze with brilliant little points of light, the millions of suns of the galaxy and the galaxy beyond ours. On the other side, the side toward which they fell, the sun was a blinding sphere of white light, its huge coronal flames wavering fearfully around its orb. Seen to one side, surprisingly close to the sun, was a tiny half-moon. "'That's Mercury,' said Russ, pointing it out the smallest planet and the closest to the sun. After we leave Venus, we'll have to visit it. We know there's a sun-tap station there, and because it's so close to the sun, its orbit ranges between twenty-eight million miles and under forty-four million miles, the station must be a most important and large one. Burl gazed at the point of light that was the innermost planet. Those sun-tap stations, the more I think about it, the more I wonder what we're up against. It seems to me that it ought to be easy for the kind of people who can build such things to catch us and stop us. In fact, I wonder why they haven't already gone after us for stopping the one on Earth. Russ whistled softly between his teeth. We've some ideas about that. The military boys worked on it. You know, you can figure out a lot of things from just a few bits of evidence. We have such evidence from what happened to you on Earth. You ought to speak to Haynes about it. Burl turned away from the viewer. Let's find him now. I don't think he's very busy. He said something about catching up on his reading this period. Russ nodded, and the two of them got up from their seat. With a wave to Oberfield and Caton on duty at the controls, the two climbed down the ladder that led into the middle part of the living space. They looked into Haines' quarters, but he wasn't there, so they went down the next hatchway into the lower section. Haynes and Ferrati were sitting at a table in the cooking quarters, drinking coffee. The two men, both heavy and muscular, used to the open spaces and the feel of the winds, were taking the enforced confinement in the cramped and artificially oxygenated space of the ship with ill ease. For them it was like a stretch in jail. They greeted the two younger men jovially and invited them to a seat. While Russ poured a coffee for himself, Burl opened the subject of how much the expedition had worked out about the enemy. Haines' pale blue eyes gleamed. You can know an awful lot about an enemy if you know what he didn't do as well as what he did do. If you figure out what you yourself should have done under the same circumstances, 
and no, he didn't do it. Why, that gives you some valuable hints as to his deficiencies. As we see it, we've got a fighting chance of spoiling his game. Certainly, if spoiling it long enough to allow Earth several more years to get a fleet of ships like this into operation and give him plenty of trouble. Suddenly, Burl felt more cheerful. At the back of his mind there had been a carefully concealed point of cold terror. He remembered the clean efficiency of the Suntap station, the evidence of a science far beyond that of Earth. He pressed the point. Just what do we really know? Haynes leaned back and rubbed his hands together. There were several things that gave their weaknesses away. When we put it all together, we decided that the enemy represents some sort of limited advance force or scouting group of a civilization still too far away to count in the immediate future. We decided that the enemy isn't too aware of our present abilities, that his intelligence service is poor as far as modern Earth is concerned. We figured he won't be able to act with any speed to repair the damages we make. Tell them how we worked that out, said Ferrati, who had begun to grow again the short black beard that Burl remembered he had worn on his famous expeditions. Well, said Haynes, drawing the word out to build up suspense, did you know that the station in the Andes, the one you cracked open, was built at least thirty years ago and never put into operation in all that time? Burl was surprised. Why, I hadn't thought of it, but it could have been. That valley was so isolated and deserted, probably nobody would ever have spotted it. Right, Haynes added, and our investigation team studied the remains, the foundations, the layout, and we're sure it's been there at least three decades. That's one clue. The second clue was the relative flimsiness of the walls. The builders hadn't expected us to be able to blow them up. They were some sort of quick construction a plastic strong but not able to hold up against blasting powder, let alone real heavy bombs or A-bombs. Now, why was that? And the third clue, why didn't they have a repair system available, or at least some sort of automatic anti-aircraft defense? Burl looked at Ferrati. The latter was watching him shrewdly to see if he could figure it out. The builders didn't expect an air attack, said Burl slowly, because of the air disturbances. They did not know we have a moon base that could spot their location. Hence, they figured out that our civilization would remain as it was thirty years ago. We wouldn't have been able to spot the location at that time because it required outer space observation. It might have taken us several years of tramping around to locate it, and the lack of a strong permanent construction. After all, a concrete and steel-enforced embankment which any military force on Earth could have put there would have balked your dynamite attack, probed Haynes. That means they didn't have the time or the means to make such construction. They must have had a single ship with the kind of equipment that could lay out a quick base in the shortest time, said Burl. Right, snapped Haynes. The Sun Tap must have been built by a relatively small team which probably came in a single explorer ship. The ship was equipped with automatic factory machinery that could turn out an adequate base for an uninhabited planet an airless moon, and so on, but they didn't have the stuff for a fortified base, and they didn't have the manpower to build it. Another indication of that is the thirty-year delay, added Ferrati. Obviously, they arrived in this solar system from somewhere outside it. We figure that way because otherwise they would have been prepared to do the job on all the planets in the same trip and start operations at once. They must have made some observations of this solar system from a point in space at least as far away as another star. That means not less than four and a half light years away, Proxima Centauri being the nearest star after our sun, and four and a half light years from us. Their observations were imperfect. They found more planets and problems than they had supposed, so they had to make a second trip to get enough supplies to finish their sun tap base constructions. It took them thirty years between the first stations and the ones that completed the job, and that, too, suggests that only one ship was originally involved here. Of course, maybe they came back with more the second time, but it still looks as if the main force hasn't arrived, and won't until after the sun novas. Then that means, said Burl quickly, that we are still dealing with just a small and isolated group? Maybe, said Haynes. Just what constitutes a small group may be hard to say. I rather think they'd have brought the engineers 
and at least an advanced working party of settlers with them the second trip in. But they are still short of available ships. They're still not aware of what we may be going to do. Why is that? asked Burl. Haines looked thoughtful. This is conjecture. But if they've planted any spies among our Earth people, there's been no contact, because otherwise they'd have known we could track and crack their base as soon as it started. This means that they still haven't had scouting ships to spare for checking up on what they did the first time. No checkup means no spare personnel to do the checking. They just assumed that we hadn't caught on and started operations by remote control as they had originally planned. And that also means that these people are hard up, said Ferrati. Wherever they came from, their civilization has been great, but it's gone to seed. They plan to seize another solar system, start over again, and they haven't the manpower to do an adequate job, and they haven't the abundance of material needed to set up simple checking guard stations such as any major Earth nation would have the sense to do. Why, that means we've got a fighting chance to lick em, said Burl joyfully. I kept thinking we'd run into more than we could cope with. We've got a fighting chance, all right, said Haines. We may be able to rip up their sun-tap layouts. But what if we meet the main explorer ship itself? Anybody who can cross interstellar space and warp the power of the sun can probably outshoot, outrun, and outfight us. Let's hope we don't meet them until we've done our work. On this note the little discussion broke up as the gong rang for the next watch. It made sense to Burl. If the Magellan could just operate fast enough, keep on the jump, they'd save the day. But, and he realized that nobody had mentioned it aloud, it also followed that the enemy, however small its group, was still in the solar system somewhere and would certainly be starting to take action very soon now. The time came when the ship was to start slowing to prepare itself for the meeting with Venus. Burl saw the hour and minute approach and watched Lockhart take the controls and set the new readings. The steady hum of the generators, a vibration that had become a constant feature of the ship, altered, and for everyone it was a relief. Their minds had become attuned to the steady pitch. One didn't realize how annoying a nuisance it was until it stopped. As the stellar generators let down on the drag on the sun, the gravity within the ship lessened. In a few moments there was a condition of zero, and those who had forgotten to strap themselves down found that they were floating about in the air, most of them giddy. There was a shift in the pitch, and the generators applied repulsion against the pull of the sun. Those floating in the air crashed suddenly against the ceiling then slid violently down the walls onto the floor as the inner sphere rotated on its gimbals to meet the new center of gravitational pull, this time away from the sun. The viewers flickered off and then on again as their connecting surfaces inside and outside the sphere's double layer of walls slid apart and matched up again. For an instant as he saw the viewers blank out, Burl thought of what might happen if the sphere didn't rotate all the way they would find themselves blind. Now the ship proceeded on its charted orbit, slowing to meet Venus. Several hours went by, one meal, and Burl had returned to his bunk, his rest period having arrived. Russ remained at the controls on duty, checking astronomically the new speed and deceleration. Burl tossed restlessly the light out in the little cabin. Something was bothering him, and after a while he realized that Clyde should have come off duty before this. He glanced at the clock and calculated that Russ was two hours overdue. What was wrong? He slipped out of his bunk and climbed into his pants. Ascending into the control room, he saw Lockhart, the two astronomers, and the entire engineering crew gathered over the controls in worried concentration. He peered over their shoulders, but the dials meant little to him since he did not know what they should have said. "'What's happened?' he asked Russ. Russ took him aside. "'We're not going to make our connection with Venus,' he said. "'Our generators didn't operate exactly as we had hoped. "'We haven't been able to slow down enough. "'The pull of the sun is stronger than the power we can raise "'to stop it at our present speed. "'We're going to shoot past Venus' orbit way ahead of the planet, "'and we're still heading sunward at a faster rate than we figured on.' "'You mean we're falling into the sun?' gasped Burl. As things stand right now, said the youthful astrogator, that's just what is happening. 
End of chapter 6. Recording by Tom Weiss. Tom's Audiobooks.com.